Hello everyone, today we talk about the Roman early imperial, partly also late republican musicians, also known as Ainatores, because their uh, wind instruments were mostly made of bronze. Uh, and I already made a video about Roman sound signals that illustrates the uh, characteristics of the various uh, musical instruments used uh, in the Roman army, which had a, a very specific uh, musical culture. Uh, in that regard, uh, it was strongly, let's say, European in as much as, for example, there was there were no drums that, that we know of that were mostly a, a Middle Eastern um, thing. Think about the Parthians. I made a video also about Islamic military music that dates back in part to, to that, and and the different um, uh, the different needs that, uh, in fact, such armies really had in drilling the troops, signaling. Uh, etc. The Romans belong to the sound infantry based world where units are very thickly compact. On a battlefield the arrays can be massive because of numbers but as we will see now the distribution of this musical instrument was also significantly thick and was a very um, close interaction between the units. Made some video here and there about Roman tactics that were still however, somehow circling around, and I promise we'll get into that quite thoroughly, um, and about which also, of course, there are many, uh, many doubts. Historically, we do not know uh, in, in absolute terms so much about the Roman army. In relative terms, obviously, we are privileged, and exquisitely so, of course, to, to have like uh, the, the, the type of culture that would allow us to know that much that we do know, like the Chinese weren't like this, like uh, the Indians weren't like that, um, the, the, the the Middle Easterners weren't like that, not even the Greeks were, were like the Romans, so there is um, a lot which, um, say, emanates from the entire output of Roman civilization that has a very specific um, uh, mentality, which is not just warlike per se, uh, but uh, definitely uh, careful about properly the the the, the concrete uh, aspects um, of warfare to the scale that the empire naturally had reached. Uh, this is another uh, another aspect naturally of 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 the wall. But it still has to do with this because when you look at uh, musical, well, let's say ancient music in general, that that's something definitely which I'm not. Uh, an expert, but um, the my, I've met people who research these topics, study I don't know Celtic or I don't know even Aztec uh, musical instruments and this stuff, and they tell you that of course um, what what we should be knowing that we do not picture generally, not even for medieval armies uh, in general, etc. Of how multisensorial, um, not just music. I'd say the occasions within which music would be played, but in this sense, how much warfare really was as a spiritual experience, right? Musical instruments were obviously endowed, as we will see now, with a you know, um, a sacral value, together with other basically everything in the world by hierarchy, um, but that were meant essentially to 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 express not merely mechanical orders, but in this sense, the will of God, right? And and that, of course, through the imperial medium, that was to essentially emanate this this force, which the instruments were, you know, in a very dense and also, uh, say, as we will see now, the Romans used um, a very specific set of instruments, as we were saying before, that were focusing, especially on. On, on the attack, right? I made a video that I don't remember. I think it was um, trumpets and drums, something about uh, discipline um, in order in that kind of Apollonian Dionysian kind of function. Naturally, this, the various instruments used by the Romans had um, a different type um, of, of characteristics that could vary, like the sound from something very acute to something very, you know, uh, low. Um, and so mirroring in that sense as well the the contrast that obviously existed just think between the nights 
and the infantry, the auxiliaries that made uh, up the majority of the Nor of the Roman army numerically, were using surely their traditional uh, instruments. And this is something about which we are unfortunately not overwhelmingly documented as always, as it would be normal, because surely these aspects were secondary to others uh, in all this great uh, war machine. But understanding them through this perspective uh, is, in my opinion, much more useful than just the, the merely, say, the, the mere technical aspect, right? Archaeology tells us something that we should be able, even though we're, of course, um, impossibilitated to, to, to try to, to think what that sound, what that um, instrument was used in, say, contextually, right? Uh, like, and and that experience, like just the one of, of an ancient battle, is of course something very distant from our moral uh, understanding, our the, just the, the intensity in the way we live, right, of, of the lack thereof, by the way. Uh, today I focus on the Roman musician as part of the series on historical military units, so uh, as you have noticed here and there I... I pick even some very, like, apparently, like, not properly units, like, of trooper type, just like right now, for the sake of completion. But without that, you would miss still a fundamental uh, element of what the entire system really was. So I hope also that we're going to come back more powerfully uh, on the Roman army, Roman history, uh, in the future. Right. So, uh, the... Uh, Roman musician, so they belong essentially to the category of uh, of NCOs, right? Under officers that in the century, and we will see now, so because we're not completely sure about the, the actual distribution, but we can approximate in order of seniority the signifer, right? So the standard bearer, the optio, who was the centurion's deputy, and the cornican or Buchinator, right? So these would be essentially the, we can't say the trumpeters, but they're not exactly trumpets we're, uh, we're talking about, or, nor only something that comes um, necessarily close to them um, in, uh, in concept. And the Tesserarius, that is the officer of, of the watchword. Now, if you look at the hierarchy here, you, you realize that the musicians are essentially between this, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in some cases even some leaders, like at least the Signifer, as you know, was um, uh, bearing the standard also as essentially a second in command to the Canturio. And the insignia were, of course, sacred per se, right? And the fact that the musician uh, comes after these, and that after them there is also the officer at watch where you would say, well, let's maybe... A less important figure, well, in, in relative terms, yes, but it's still a big deal, right? Because all this was based on a concept of fides that essentially held the entire Roman military, not just as the most efficient um, part of the Roman state, but also the um, essentially the 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 armed force, and so the, the the military instrument of the imperium, and so of God Himself. So this position evidently highlights that the same music, the same signals, were, of course, um, media themselves of the same divine order, the same divine command. I made multiple videos about Roman religion, so if you want, I will probably post the list, uh, as usually, in the uh, top comment um, uh, fixed uh, in below, but the uh, the sense here is that there is no such thing as um, as a, as a civilization. This is not just about Rome, um, but any meaning whatsoever without this awareness that the the force that agitates within the universe is, of course, of something goes far beyond mere humanity, at least for how it has fallen, and, and the Romans were 
completely um, say aware of this at the time uh, in a unsecular and unmodernized uh, world definitely compared uh, to our own. So regarding the equipment, the armament uh, of the of the musicians, we, we can call them Ainatores if you prefer. Um, we don't have so much to say. Some of them have their caps covered by bear skin, right, and, and other, you know, animal uh, skin, like this is basically the same concept of the berserkers, the same, you know, brotherhoods of warriors and, and leaders as, as such that degree as essentially figures that were transforming, right, and transfiguring by rising up through the ranks. We were mentioning before the Signifer that, in that sense, is perhaps the most iconic figure as far as animal skin wearing, etc. Because um, those are the lower the, um, ranks, just like in the war bands, the leader is somehow an Apollonian figure, but the others are enter literally as animals because they have to be able to dominate that animal force in order to be able to transcend from the previous persons that they are no more, by the way, because they, they acquired another identity in front of God. Um, and this, in a sense, was still alive in the Roman army, uh, for which um, the, the Milites, um, for the Roman world, that like the Milas was really um, like another person. It was the, the idea of oh, um, wearing the Kingulum Militaris, having the right of bearing arms, Right, already in a largely disarmed context, um, and in spite of our, say, understanding of a sort of flat, um, you know, kibitas optimo iure, at least for full um, Roman citizens, still constituted um, a mark of nobility, as it would remain throughout basically all of history. Right, if you bear arms, you're truly free. Um, this system, this was won by the terrifying Roman. Uh, training that was you know itself just like an actual military experience and one of the single most brutal things that you can imagine um, especially for for a civilized um, people right at this point in their history so of course now I will not digress on the obvious uh, war likeness of these um, uh, of the Romans, the fact that they still retained an enormous amount of characteristics from their tribal past, the, the taste for blood, for decapitations, um, for, for of course, individual deeds, and so the, the incredibly tempered balance between discipline and virtus, right, that uh, is the one that effectively makes, from a psychological point of view, a an effective warriors, not discipline alone, it's prevalently discipline, um, and especially the, the one held rationally, Apollonianly, we would say, by the Imperator, but you cannot have a warlike people in that sense if you do not have that, even in individualistic behavior, to brutally and traumatically discipline, to become one of the single most wonderfully effective slaughtering machines in the history of mankind, if not properly the most the, the most beautiful one in absolute terms. Yet the fact, again, that the musician was wearing such uh, distinctive uh, skins in this case, as really shows you how uh, fierce, beast-like, and so with this sort of um, virtuosistic fashion, similar to some of the greatest fighters like the Signifery that were second just to the Kenturiones, uh, these musicians really were, right? So today we'll tell something about the background of these guys, not just in, in a military function, but, but remember that the ones evidently uh, serving in on campaign, etc., were, were fully part of the... Um, of the fight, uh, they were just in, in the first lines together, uh, also close, very close to the uh, Canturio, so they necessarily had to know how, how to, to defend themselves. Um, we do not see any particular arms or, or armament d distinction here. Some, as we will see now, observe that they are mostly represented with um, the chain mail so that they could breathe better, say, as opposed to 
with plate armor, right? It's just a, uh, my opinion, it's an exaggeration, uh, but it may have to do something like that. We also noticed that in the sources, the the Ainatores are distinguished between the uh, the the Munas and 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 the ones who weren't. Um, to make a long story short, that is that uh, normally the musicians were not spared the uh, camp, the field um, labor, right, fatigues. Um, so that only some of them would get exempted in virtue of whichever their place was in the legion. Because as we will see now, these people were part as just if you think about the same contubernium uh, the, the these were different because they were separated from the others but they um for this reason in fact had other f as forms of association we can say certain distinctions like you know that every legion every cohort had sort of cult uh, on its own as part of the of the bigger say feudal one uh, of the of the empire um and as such, um, they would develop their own characteristics. We can't think even their own their own music, even though um, probably the uh, as we will see, they, these were competent mus musicians also in other fields, because um, they could play at least other instruments uh, next to these ones that we think were mostly uh, capable of providing naturally sim with simple sounds. We, we do not have the the complete proof of that, but at least a binary system of orders, especially for the sake of simplicity of being understood, memorized more easily by the troops, is something. But surely these people were talented on their own, and even at least their, their prowess, uh, musically-wise, was estimated as much as, and together with, as, as a constitutive part of the same military one, the warlike one. Because they had to inspire the entire army with this. Um, and there are, again, lots of reproductions, even some, think about the, the Kartnex, etc., that, that show you pretty pretty accurately. Today we talk about this late Roman, a uh, late Republican, so called, and, and early Imperial Roman period. But let's say, think about the. The, the centuries before and how also unstandardized and how, as they would remain throughout the, the, the entire Roman history some say the, the, the tools that these soldiers used from whichever background they were and what degree of um, customization was possible even just with in music in instruments in references in, in symbols of in meaning that were expressed by this music, about which, unfortunately, we know practically nothing, right? Um, especially in the military sense. Again, th t today's video is not about that. Again, if you go in, in the Roman sound signal, um, signal systems uh, video, you, you will find the actual characteristics of the sound of, the, of all the, the instrument, right? Um, we uh, th there was we understand a distinction. The cardinus was used for mostly addressing the ensign bearers, the the tuba to all the soldiers, right? As far as the distribution, we realized that uh, there was one tubican, so the player of the tuba, um, for either one maniple, um, even or or a cohort, the Carnican may have been uh, for one maniple or even for a single Kenturia. Um, the the Bukina was used instead normally to change the guard, the, the turns, um, uh, counting the hours, uh, things like this. The Litus then is probably associated with the classic and it was a very loud uh, signaling system, but again, we have a relatively few uh, evidence, and now we will talk about this um, overall uh, f uh, finds function, and a bit especially of the background of the the musicians as such. To understand who they were, but which kind of background they 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 came from, also say musically, right? Not just uh, I don't know for social or, or whatever. Right, um, cavalry musicians were present. They 
they also do not seem to have been different in any other way from the the the, the one of the of the infantry. Um, however, they do not seem to have used the cardinal, right? Instead, mainly relying on the tuba rather, right? The tuba was this long, um, straight instrument, like like a modern trumpet, a little bit. Um, is always mentioned as the military instrument par excellence, making a somehow gloomy sound, though, right? So the sense that this, that the trumpet hits more the the tympanum, and so it's meant to give just this more direct, aggressive um, push, like also used as a as a cavalry, mostly for for cavalry, right? As we have observed here, that the cardinal was not um, exactly for it in that way um, but is fitting the general mindset of the Roman legionnaires that were incredibly aggressive like the entire moral load here was about who really in this system would be the, the hardest you know that um, after the Vietnam War there was this kind of uh, impression made even among the, uh, the historians for which you know they, they thought conservatively that they had been defeated because they hadn't preserved, um, um, say, talking about the, the West and the American side, the, um, uh, the the troops enough, and so they developed for some some decade, like the the idea that uh, ancient engagements were so conservative. That's where the idea of the completely and perfectly thickly compact hope lights just poking each other with you know, the spear tips of bow, um, like the spears held over arm was the only possible thing to minimize but the actual ancient battle is the single most brutally aggressive and in part still as we were saying before individualistic kind of warfare that can coexist and especially the roman si uh, case being the really the, the best example of uh, within a an incredibly and brutally um, imposing discipline Right, they needed both. They needed that delicate balance uh, between the two things, right? And and the Roman legionnaire had all those kind of um, exaltation modes that could make him even fight in in solo, etc. Um, these are all a bit the, the stereotypes that somehow we received the fact that I don't know the gladius, which is just like a that's part of the same prejudice, sort of. Um, of, of stock like for for trusting while in its most uh, frequent um, uh, forms uh, historically was and especially the originary one was uh, an excellent captain weapon uh, and was always cited by the Sparta throughout all this also late Republican and early um, early imperial times which is usually what you do not you're not uh, told that much, at least legionnaires are mostly represented with that weapon. And there is no doubt that there was an increased compaction, increased need for that kind of, you know, trusting. But it happens um, with the, also the reduction in, uh, in a synergic context where definitely the Roman army had a dramatically effective um, combined armed system. Uh, but that, in that sense, was gradually declining as much as that somehow barbaric I italic background that was fixated not differently from I don't know the, the Celts or the Barons whatever uh, on still the, the warrioristic ethos like was um, uh, ha had been right so uh, this would never run out again the Roman legionnaires were designed uh, psychophysically to be capable of really seeing themselves projecting their force to a to a superhuman level, because the sense was at the end of the day that the transcendental aim, and and this required some massive feats of, also of, of athleticism, of uh, you know fencing and so on. Um, aside from the the bigger deal, that was the of course the the ferocious compactness of deriving from collective training. Um, so you understand that in this context, having musical instruments which are able to be that flashy, like about, like for example, exploiting 
a given tactical situation. Therefore, you see it even from the the Roman helmets at this point, right? They have this beautifully, massively built uh, Italic, Gallic um, helmets with massive um, protection, neck guards, uh, reinforcements of the structure, so on. But they have a, a pretty large uh, and, and equivocal um, hole uh, in correspondence of the year, right? It's not that the Roman legion was not concerned receiving like a, a, a you know, a sword tip into his brain through, through, through the uncovered side, but obviously and forcefully um, hearing was uh, much more important for personal safety than even the, the armor protection of that part of your head, right? So orders were obviously uh, that important uh, and that complex evidently for requiring the soldiers to in fact unisonly hear uh, them uh, in, in, in such a you know uncompromised way which means that the sound had the capacity of commanding himself again it was the divine sound um, say diluted through the degenerated imperfect material means of, of the fallen world but that still arrived down to the trooper right to confer him this kind of uh, capacity this protection over him um, the bukina that we remember before uh, um, and the horse sound of the cardinal playing the classicum is also neat, uh, noted by uh, Propertius, for example, there are lots of references, generally speaking, to these uh, scattered here and there to these instruments, so not for the military purpose, uh, of course. Uh, in Aquincum, a local dedicatory inscription to his wife was left by a mercenary, interestingly enough, of the Legio Secunda Adutrix, who was a professional water organ player. This is this is fascinating as well. I mean, they they would hire a uh, a soldier, right? That was not here part of the uh, say uh, organic. That among his the other things, like as a as a fighter, knew also how to play a water organ player that was also a quite complex machinery say developed in in the Hellenistic world like the Romans as most of it adopted and and perfected um and that that did this for a living by the way so um this this aspect is fascinating because naturally all these instruments here you see also an organ etc would make some uh, some articulate sound, something that perhaps was not even specifically needed in um again for the sake of sound signaling. Remember the I don't know the Teutonic knights that arrived with their own organ and playing before battle, the, the Marian songs, etc. Well, this is something similar. This guy in Aquincum may have played the organ for the legions. For example, during the gladiatorial games. This this is an overlooked factor that the Romans were fixated with gladiatorial games, something you do not find, for example, in the eastern part of the empire, it was Hellenic in nature, Hellenistic, because the entire deal of being a Roman had been since the 4th century, being a, being a soldier, being a, a warrior, being a fighter, wherever they would see it conceptually, which all have here, like, the word semantic differences that should be reported to, to, to the times, um, but it was a thing because wherever the Roman legionnaires or colonists went, they would build an arena for gladiatorial games. That was the old mark of being a Roman, wanting to see and knowing how to, yourself, as a Roman citizen, knowing how to spill blood, right? And being um, galvanized by that, because it was the, like, we have analyzed properly in, in the transfigurational sense of the of of the imperial catholic tradition like the necessity spilling blood i made a video about this that is 
um, the way where the fire of that blazes, right, and the role of the Dionysian specifically uh, in the um, in the uh, in the same Apollonian transfiguration, it, it is a thing. I never made a video about gladiatorial games, but they were pretty. Not obviously just pretty dark uh, meanings there, but s some that were deeply connected still not to the, the game per se, um, as you would see a reenactment today, but so sort of detached from, from the sense of reality. But at the time, like as again, a, a declination of the Roman imperial world order as the, the highest achievement that needed the sacrifice in order to be um, satisfied. Think, for example, about the role of the Undertakers and how much that is represented in the, uh, you know, in, in Etruscan art of, of previous centuries, etc. There are all the, of course, these were universal figures in the mythology um, of, of the time for any people, but the sense that um, the, as we were saying at the beginning of the video, the experience not to reenact it, but literally carried out, because these people would kill each other, and yes, before somebody says smart ass comes up and say, well, gladiators cost so much they didn't kill each other, where actually there were entire specific sections of the game where they, they, they slaughtered prisoners that were implicitly those who had li lost the Imperium, and so they were sacrificed. Um, this is not different from what was done among tribes, man, that there was a, by the way, just li like today's top football players would be of course the ones who wouldn't like to sacrifice that much but uh, gladiatorial games just per se were often very um, very much especially in, in the I can't say specifically just in the origins but as by principle conceived to be that kind of um, sacred sacrifice uh, and uh, not just staged but you know, literally carried out with this means, right? So the entire experience had to be uh, like in an Atlantic tragedy that stemmed from mythical reenactment being accompanied with all those, um, all with that sensorial experience which would complete the, the archetypal meaning of what was happening, right? So things like water organs here could objectively replicate something very very deep right and uh, faceted and articulate just like I don't know, the, the the organs of the Teutonic Knights right on the battlefield were meant in in the same way to, to represent the, the universal order of nature and of God etc so it was basically the same um, and uh, everything had always remained the same, obviously, in, in traditional culture. Uh, consider that uh, in Aquincon, that is the ancient Buddha, as you know, um, a complete portable organ, the Hydra, has been recovered intact. So uh, also archaeologically speaking, we, we get a dimension, of course, of how, um, let's say, uh, notoriously, by the way, even just to, to documentary sources, how musical these wars uh, really were, and how I, I made lots of videos about uh, shield patterns, um, the the colors of the Roman uniform, thing, things like this. They all had a, together with the symbols, the insignia, and so on, a very specific meaning in that function, right? That you couldn't quite escape, elude, because it was the actual religion, the official one, especially the one of the army, that was the the most uh, the most important mean for uh, to the end of, of the world transfiguration for the golden age so the, the symbol of 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 the augustan achievement par excellence um this is really crucial we'll come we'll come back on gladiatorial games and the meaning in the also imperial policy um etc now several funerary monuments of roman military musicians some of which i uploaded in the pictures here as well survive for us to get a quite concrete imagery of what they wanted, essentially, to be um, to be living uh, after death in this imperial um, imperial order that would resurrect the world, also through their work that would have been, in fact, the one of uh, of media, right, through through God Himself. Um, 
so it would be interesting to, to know, for example, what kind of fate the musical instruments had, um, like uh, compared to to actual weapons for for these guys, because they evidently were an instrument. The word deep. I made a video about, especially the, well, about the gladi in general. But um, the, we have analyzed in some of them better the the, the meaning of the gladius, just in its um, conceptual sacrificial aggressive. Um, symbolism right and so the, the 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 musical instrument here takes on a sort of directing uh, guiding um, transcendental form as well uh, remember like in the like just in the uh, the Celtic instruments and so on you know the, the face of monsters of other creatures connected again still with the sense of the uh, warrior transfiguring through combat and so on were, were meant to emanate the same voices of the gods uh, that would be speaking through them right as sacred animals this is pertaining to them this is quite quite known and the the, the sounds that could be achieved were also dramatically at, at least uh, shaded complex and so on to, to simulate even properly an animal sound Right here, the case was somehow different because the Romans had, as you know, a very square geometrical principle, and such a primitive archaic one in, in the essence that the figure, the anything that was sensualistically pictorial, it was not really was looked um, down to with 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 contempt because it would somehow distract the absolute principle of action. Right, so it's part of the reason, perhaps, why this. Um, the the Roman musical instruments were more, in fact, Apollonian, as we were saying before, than the one of of other peoples, right? The drums uh, have a uh, a function mostly of uh, mostly a Dionysian, a hypnotic one, right? Uh, whereas also other um, wind instruments, but still with animal symbolism, were not were maybe just for the for the auxilia, right? As subjected peoples that could still have that lower form of imagery um, uh, as far as the the at least the hierarchy was was concerned so unitly music there was more important even of course than and the instrument than for example the bear skin I mean the signifier is not bearing the symbol of a of a wolf or a, or a hawk so, you know that before Marius, that the eagle was not standardized yet because the empire had yet to ascend to world domination, and so to the complete perfection of um, of the eagle, right? The only animal able to look straight at the sun uh, in mythology and acting as uh, as an apostle, as a as an angel, as a messenger, right? Um, of of the Holy Ghost. Uh, so. This this instrument—it's as if this instrument, as the insignia and um, parts of the sacred weapons as well, had been more important, of course, than the human. Um, let's say that at least those that element of humanity that had still to, say, to transcend to elevate himself by mimicking here among the NCOs. So. Um, uh, the 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 sense of a like of an inferior initiatic kind of kind of status, right? Of course, those symbols existed everywhere, but as you know, the emperors were associated with with Apollonian symbolism. Um, lower ones were present, but as a, as a form of symbol of the trans uh, of the trans uh, say the transfiguration in theory, such as Hercules lion skin, for example, which is a part of the same. Uh, thing it, it, it's an idea why the griffin as a mix between ketonic and uh, uh, uranian animals figures so prominently I don't know and we've seen it in the iconography of Norman uh, Shields for example one of, of Bayeux but also because the, the sense was that this of man being still of the human at this point being still between the the two dimensions, and so having been tested, the Romans said vivere militare est, so that is to say existence as such is, is a war. It, it's part of the, the cosmic struggle as well. So this would have been more fanatically portrayed in a military context 
that had to to substantiate uh, the strongest that kind of tension under which these men were right um, among the various funerary monuments of Roman military musicians the the best preserved is indeed the one of the Carnican C point we do not know his praenomen Coponius Felicio were in the late Flavian period uh, and the man uh, here I couldn't find the 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 non copyrighted material so I couldn't upload it but there are similar ones right and in that specifically the man is represented clad in a simple tunica interestingly enough uh, because you, they didn't necessarily have to appear in full panoply at all, right, in this funerary monument. So it's not just a prerogative of these guys, or, you know, just a preference mostly um, in these monuments. Um, in a military cloak, the sagum pinned on the right shoulder. So very simple um, standard dress for, for, a, for a Roman citizen. Similar equipment is shown on the funerary relief of Victor, a soldier member of the Collegium, that is the guild, of the Litikines and Cornicines. That is to say, literally a corporation of musical players. Right, so this guy was not just uh, part of the military, but, mm, and here we do not know it precisely, but possibly of a military collegium within within the army because we've seen this stuff existing like uh, abundantly even among the Roman Imperial Guard etc they all had some kind of cult within them that they, they had their own altars they had their own practice um, the the ancient world was effectively all like this um, this funerary relief was found in the excavations uh, of a villa in Croce Moschito near Sezze, close to, to Rome. We were talking about it in that video about medieval Lazio just recently, by the way. Uh, and Victor holds with his left hand a litus, while his cardinal, with a typical crossbar for, for the grip, because the corner is made like an S, like in the extremities of the curb are linked by uh, like the handle, basically, so to confer um, uh, solidity to to the to the structure, but also to to, to have like a bar to to handle it. Um, so this typical crossbar for the grip, perfectly represented at his feet in that in that context, you can see the same bar uh, for the corner in the monument of Coponius Felicio. On the Trajanic monuments, where all these instruments are well represented, Cornicines are equipped with male shirts, were pointed out before, because possibly of, of the greater capacity of breathing deeper, right, um, than with plate armor. But it may also be like uh, just uh, not so so influential as a factor. Now the wearing of um, the the Laurica Amata by the Buccinatores is, however, confirmed also by the Adam Clazy monument that I the picture of which I uploaded uh, here. The only main difference is that on Trajan's column, the heads of some musicians are covered by animal skins, like the standard bears, right? And in the other case, that they're not. So this could, as we were saying before, depend just on factors that we talk about the Roman army, but again, we would have been surprised by how, say, varied the appearance of these forces would be throughout, not just throughout the, the ages, but... Um, from from legion to legion, from unit to unit, even within uh, the larger one. Now, complete specimens of and fragments of musical instruments are definitely rare, um, to say the least. Um, we do have them, however. 
We even have a complete litus from Salzburg made of bronze and 74 centimeters long. Right? It was like a, like a long horn, similar, like conceptually even to the, some other, like, you know, ballet horns or something like that. I mean, just in different size and conceptually so. There's a bronze tuba from Schambeck uh, in Hungary. It is quite well preserved and it was originally, this is preserved in its fragmentary form now, 148 centimeters long. We have mouthpiece from Vindavissa, Vindish, uh, Switzerland, either from a tuba or, or a cornu, and a fragment of cornu from Stratgit in, in Scotland, and various pieces of tuba slash bukina, because we can't quite um, identify them sometimes, and cornu, probably from Alst, that is um, Augusta Raurica, uh, near Basel. Finally, various parts of cornu braces have been found in Trier, Stuttgart, Strasbourg, and Murart. Right, thanks at least to some you know, archaeological uh, intensiveness. They are, of course, there are many others scattered, God knows where, uh, that are just waiting to be found. Um, and among the other things, I mean, there are so many other things to, to be found archaeologically, also, of course, more important than this. But still, right, um, this is uh, telling us how, of course, uh, habitual musical instruments were, how much of an organization actually existed uh, to confer the legions, not just, again, a, as we've seen, a mechanic uh, s sound signal. Uh, but something spiritual connected with it. Uh, the various collegi again had their own um, their own rights. That was uh, surely a lot connected to it. you know that you know the the the, the Salian dances the the first the most important and, and archaic uh, practice of Rome is still the, the emperors or the would be ones practiced in an initiatory warlike way were connected with dances of war that obviously entailed uh, a, um, a musical accompaniment. That this is in another source just what was happening in the arenas um, during those fights uh, etc. So uh, it, it, we would be surprised as, as, as time travelers to understand how colorful say noisy or musical if you prefer um, this word really was how much what of the displays were choreographed, how much battles themselves were uh, provided with this poetic as terrifying art um, to to guide the effort while people were getting slaughtered just under uh, with on on the note on these tones, um, and this is true for any uh, even for visual um, images for what were presented on the shields on the effect that again the the fallen world was meant to make on the weaker right a bit it's a bit like the the gorgon the medusa the fact that uh, you know if you scare it those will let themselves be scared just by appearances right and by the uh, the lack of apollonian perfection so something that is is illusory or it exists only in virtue of the failure of man to be able to free itself from it. Like you, you can understand the the truest heart of the imperial Catholic tradition, because this is what the Romans and basically any other people at the time were exclusively about. Their entire religion was it, um, and this this aspect, let's say, of musical instruments can 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 help um, in a way and it's unfortunately however still one of those things that can't quite be reconstructed with any uh, specific degree of certainty when it comes to the actual sounds to the actual music I mean of course there are replicas of things like this but uh, again it's not even it, it doesn't make any sense just to count on it per se because again they these instruments were part of a broader concert literally that didn't 
that we have no clue of. Right? So even if you know you can represent something that you still will never have the idea whether it sounds like like the original instruments, still you you know nothing about the most important aspect for which it was created. Right? It's a bit like uh, I don't know. My my constant criticism towards hymnists that you know concentrate on individual fights and pretend that that's, that has anything, but I mean literally anything to do with the art of war or military historical competence or strategic educational culture. I mean this is probably the the greatest mass delusion that we face whenever um, we want to convince the gullible that history is something easy, right? Um, and obviously that is always going to end uh, pretty badly. Uh, in any case, we will keep talking about the Roman army, the historical military uh, units, uh, and also about military music, because I, I think I have a playlist on it, right? It's one of the single most overlooked aspects, even during the Middle Ages, right, when you usually there is the, the sense that the East was a bit more musical, right, than Europe, but it, it's not Say it is true, but it's it it's it, we have removed from the other side what how the, the rich amount of musical exp auditory experience uh, that existed on European battlefields since ever, like on any battlefield, and so represented that this forces in a somehow dry, uh, say uncolorful and. Um, an un, un, un right uh, scenario, which is not the case anymore, right? And again, this music was meant to shake people's souls to a, to a degree that we have not even the, the idea of the power that they had or how concerted that they would sound altogether. Because there is also this fact that were used, like the various units that had this, were meant in part to also act together. Though these Aside from the, the uh, say, the, the instruments, the simpler ones that were used to, to s distance signal, of course, also these uh, were conceived to just confer to, to, the, to the same unit and the surrounding ones. But the Roman army, we know that, was trained to do this all together. All at once, right? It's also a myth that the Romans simply went to battle com completely silent or whatever. Caesar is quite explicit about the fact that the musical instruments plus the shouts, so the first ones, more importantly than the latter, could impress dramatically the enemy. And Caesar was someone fighting, of course, against not just other Romans, but as you know, peoples like the Gauls, etc. So a wide array of populations that, for cultural reasons or others, in contemporary times we, we decided to see in a word or another but we haven't properly pictured how deeply effective this uh, uh, s uh, s acoustic let's say dimension really was for warfare and how important it was to to them in general to 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 men of also of art of, of poetry i mean caesar was one of the single most refined poets of his time um, aside from dominating even even the the, the let's say the history the historical let's say some history is dedicated to, just also to a lower audience and so on so we tend to make everything superficial and banal because that's what we are today uh, but the world wasn't like this up to a very few centuries ago so we should really think very openly here and admitting also lots of things about ourselves uh, in the process. Now, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.